verses uh, for yesterday's contribution. Somia? No, Somia? Somia? She'll be here, I'm sure. We leave it by here for her. For today's contribution, Hasha. Okay. For the overall contribution, Arvid. Uh, best question. What he's getting is, um, it's a piece of Connemara marble which is made in Ireland. It comes from Ireland, it's stone in the west of Ireland, but embedded in it is an old Irish penny with a harp, which is the Irish emblem, but it was made in 1937, the year of the Constitution, so that commemorates it. So now we finish, and this time we can all be as bold as we like because Vasanti has had to go to a meeting, so we're all by ourselves. Uh, I hope you'll join me afterwards for a Coca-Cola and a brandy outside that'll be available um, after this lecture, which will be as short uh, uh, as we can make it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I can see. So, it's human nature to seek to, and this is the last, last slide, and if we can just have the light off for this one slide, thank you. Um, what you're looking at, uh, I will explain in, in a moment, because it has a kind of moral. What I want to say, is it's human nature to seek to discern patterns in human conduct. And it's human nature to look for patterns and systems even in nature itself. We see patterns in the structure of atoms. And it's frequently possible to construct mathematical models of such phenomena. So, such mathematical models can allow us to predict the existence or presence of things that are unknown, like black holes in space. This is called chaos theory, and if any of you are new to it, you'll know that it's a branch of mathematics focused on the behavior of what are called dynamic systems, which are highly sensitive to initial conditions. And an example of it is the one well-known metaphor of the butterfly in Japan causing the earthquake in Mexico. But that's only a metaphor. The phenomenon allows it, actually allows for forms of analysis like mi mimicry, self-organization where very small particles go in clusters. They organize themselves. And as I said, the butterfly can describe how a small change in one state of a deterministic nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. What does all this mean for those of us who like words? Small causes can have large effects. So, for example, who could have said that discussions in dark, cold Dublin in 1936 about directives of social policy, designed in some ways to fend off the attempts by some Roman Catholic Church, church members to turn the Irish Constitution into a denominational constitution, who could have said that those conversations would have resulted <coughs> in the first place in the directives of social policy in Ireland and who could have said that this strange dynamic system would have morphed, migrated to India in the way it did, but then give, who could have said it would have been given an entirely different uh, dynamic by what happened in the Indian courts. 
Who could have said that, correspondingly, the principle of basic structure, which, well, which had a small butterfly-like effect in a lecture in 1965, could have had the dynamic effect that we've described in the lectures, whereby the basic structure principle was not only adopted in India, but transferred to so many countries in Asia and so many countries in Africa. Who could have said? So, what am I saying? I'm saying that it's, I have no doubt that it is possible to construct mathematical and arithmetic models, like that one, where there are patterns, once there's a precipitate, once there's a start, you can see particles will begin to adopt patterns of repetition or mimicry, just like that one. You can put, you can put maths to chaos. But what I want to do, just very briefly, is to express a humanistic outlook. If we could possibly have the lights back on now. Could we have the lights back on, please? Yeah, thanks. Because what I'm saying is that we have been studying what seems to me to be a humanistic subject, something which on the on one hand it hinges to almost on contingency, but the more I read into it, the more I realized that the contingency was not so contingent and that so much of what takes place now in comparative constitutionalism hinges on scholarship and that, in fact, what I embarked on a month and a half ago as a deep immersion course is really a truly important subject because of the universal values which go from place to place. And there are very good books. Um, two of them I'll refer, refer, refer you to. The first is The Use of Foreign Precedents by Constitutional Judges, which is edited by Groppi, which was published by Hart in 2017. And there's another book, Comparative Constitutional Reasoning, also published by the Cam Cambridge University Press in 2017. They offer close analysis of a series of jurisdictions. And if you are interested in the subject, they're a good kickoff point. <coughs> The one noteworthy feature of these two books published in 2017 is they seek in their <coughs> respective ways to use mathematical models. Um, one, the, the book I just referred to, to a lesser extent than the other. When you read the books, and they're worth reading, you'll find that there are patterns, you'll find that there are discernible trends, and that they are reflected in, in, the, in the graphs and models which they use. The question I would raise is a more, perhaps a slightly more profound one than simply confined to this series of lectures, where you have a judge read in tooth and claw used to do, doing cases rather than a suitably qualified academic in the subject who delves deeply into the issue every day of the week. But I ask the question rhetorically, when you look at these two books, can, it, can a situation arise where there is excessive use of mathematical modeling? Can a situation arise where the modeling actually does not convey very much. So the use of statistics is something which is very prevalent and it reflects, if I say this, it reflects one of my prejudices that I wonder sometimes whether some of what I would call the humanities subjects 
uh, use mathematical models because that they feel insecure or because they feel that they're non-empirical, non-objective, or because they feel threatened by other disciplines? That's a question for you to answer. But if we look at some of the uh, material from the second book, which I referred to, you'll, you'll see, first of all, two conclusions. Legal scholars generally have the... Yeah, I'll just use that one. Yeah. Yeah. You, legal scholars use... There are motivating reasons and also there is motivated reasoning. So consequently, there are motivating reasons, which you'll see referred to there, which deal with those the procedures identified. And they lead a decision maker to choose a particular course of action. Or there's motivated reasoning, which we discussed during the week, that the judge adduces for her or his elected course of action. And when we look at the process that judges engage in, I suspect, speaking up on my own behalf, is perhaps a combination of both. The, it all depends on the context. As I indicated, it all depends on the type of issue that the courts must face. We, we ask ourselves questions like, at the very beginning of this course, how did the values which underlie our jurisdictions, jurisprudence, evolve? We've tried to answer that question. We've looked and tried to understand the formations of constitution and the structures of constitutions. We've concluded that constitutions are not just expression of values, but they are a living framework. We've concluded that constitutions are an incremental layer by layer, layer process, dependent on a form of accretion by re re reasoning. In that process, we know that history tells us the framers, aims, and objects. And in the process, we learn to understand constitutional interpretation. We understand at the end of it the value of comparative constitutional jurisprudence. We understand, I hope, a little more about the context in which, it's, which it is used. And we understand the way in which we do it in order to uh, 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 reach what I call an appropriate just adjudication. So, the, we're living, as I said earlier today, at a time when I think the rule of law is under stress, where in Europe, in the United States, perhaps elsewhere, populism poses threats to the rule of law. And what's important about comparative constitutionalism is it can work as a mutual support system so that values which are universal in content can be considered by judges from one jurisdiction to another. We live in a, a period, I think, where the spirit of internationalism, and I use that as distinct from globalism, I'm talking about international values, universal values, like in the Declaration of Human Rights, still maintain their force. And so far as judgment writing is concerned, I think we know a little more, I do anyway, that judgment writing is effectively an expression of the accrued layers of wisdom like layers of rock upon rock. So, we've looked at our constitutions, and we've seen the extent to which our two constitutions are actually quite unique in the common law world. Both 
both of them have a basic structure. I'm talking not only about as found by the judges, but as a framework you find in the Constitution. Many constitutions don't contain such a basic structure and merely con are co consist of bills of rights without preambles. Canada and Australia are examples of that. But I sought, as I sought to establish, Ireland and India are different because they seek to integrate ideals and realities. So constitutions will often, but not always, contain a preamble, a historical preamble, to contextualize. This will consist, as we know, of an invocation of history and the enablement and entitlement of the actors, of the enactors, that is the people, to, through their representatives, enact the Constitution as an act of sovereignty. Sovereignty is key. We know that constitutions identify the nature of the state and its people are peoples. We know that they contain an outline of fundamental rights, as the Indian constitution can also contains an outline of duties. We know that constitutions will frequently, as in the case of large states, contain descriptions and prescriptions outlining the framework as, as to the mode of operation between the centre and provinces or states. And we also know that constitutions will, may contain much more detail in relation to matters such as affirmative action. We know that they will contain a description of powers such as executive, legislative, judicial, and also that they contain other provisions, like in India and Ireland, for the Attorney General, Controller and Auditor General. So that's constitutions. So now let's talk about values. Constitutions will contain, in differing degrees, elements of the following values, which set out the ethos of the Constitution. First, an underlay of liberal or libertarian enlightenment rational values of the 18th century, the United States Constitution as example. So too is Australia, so too is Canada. But to differing degrees and to differing extents, constitutions will also contain aspirations and ideals derived from 19th century ideologies, such as nationalism and socialism. India and Ireland are both examples of this. Both seek to integrate the ideals within the framework of the nation state. Thus, both our respective constitutions contain elements of a vision or purpose for the nation state involving the identification of particular purposes, for example, the protection of the disadvantaged or marginalized and a more general vision of society, such as the directive uh, principles. They, in many senses, constitute the soul or the heart of constitutions. Importantly, constitutions explicitly or implicitly contain within their framework protections against majoritarianism or populism. That's in their very nature, as de Tocqueville, the French philosopher, points out. They will have protections for the maintenance of democratic values such as methodology, elections or referendums. And they will can sometimes provide mechanisms for adherence or integration, such as states wishing to join the Union of India. Other constitutions contain stipulations regarding federalism, such as the United States, Canada, Australia, India, all contain outlines regarding the relationship between the centre and the states, and not infrequently the relationship between an apex court and the court structure generally. And some constitutional documents, like the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms of the European Union, can 
contain other forms of aim or objective, such as the integration of the European member states. But as a general proposition, constitutions are not always phrased in specific terms, and any constitutional provisions are likely to be stated in broad terms when you're dealing with issues like liberty or freedom. They may be ambiguous or unclear. Some of them may contain aspiration, some of them may contain justiciable values. It's the task of courts to vindicate rights, impose duties, harmonize and balance values, and interpret legal terms so as to give expression to the values which are enshrined in constitutions, having regard to the felt needs or just requirements of the case in hand by a constitutional court. This balancing and identification of values is to be seen in many ways as an art or a craft as much as a science, but it is an art or a craft firmly based in jurisprudence which is firmly based in the Constitution and the precedents established by the court. In carrying out the process of interpretation, the court may engage in a consideration or analysis of the decision of courts and other jurisdictions which have dealt with similar issues. To be of assistance, these judgments will necessarily be drawn from jurisdictions which have a similar, similar judicial culture to the deciding court. This necessarily means that there will be an expression of similar values and similar phraseology, operating within similar me legal mechanisms such as judicial review. And these may identify rights or individuals or groups, and they may frequently appertain to two or three values such as contained in the French Constitution, such as liberty, fraternity, equality. But the important point is that it is the deciding court which brings to bear its understanding of the values, rights, and duties which are actually engaged in the national court. It is the deciding court which adjudicates and determines the outcome and will have a conception of the justice of the case. Decisions of courts made by their reasoning or expression or exposition crystallize certain concepts in a helpful way, but they will not do so very frequently in a manner which is capable of or susceptible to mathematical modeling in a way that will necessarily be predictive, at least not yet. The world is increasingly globalized we have increasing convergence on the identification of certain common values. But it seems to me that rather than the right or left, these challenges come from the very fact of alienation and the decline in faith in the legitimacy of institutions as a result of circumstances beyond those institutions themselves. Thus, in a time of stress, it's all the more important that the circumstance of the judgments of other courts in other states will assist a deciding court in engaging in the process of evaluation. But the deciding court will always ensure that that is done in a contextual way. The evidence establishes, because I'm being a judge now, that such contacts are, are sometimes contingent. They may arise as a result of judicial reading or interests, but they will frequently arise, uh, arise as a result of scholarly writing. They will arise as a result of a, a, an advocate's research. And it's in this context that scholarship plays a particularly critical role. And we've examined what happened with Colette Nat, with Dietrich, Dietrich Conrad, we've examined what happened thereafter with the doctrine which is propounded. Some of you may get involved with NGOs, and those organizations too play a critical role, along with scholarship, in ensuring that decisions which assist 
human beings are, are uh, receive the kind of uh, publicity that they require. My conclusion is that the discipline has many functions. First, it's a critical support to the rule of law itself. Second, it assists courts in reaching decisions which protect and vindicate rights. Third, it operates as a form of mutual reinforcement in a world where rights are under challenge. Fourth, it forms an important link between courts, practitioners and scholars, all of whom are involved in the process of protecting liberty. It's part of a national ethos and an international, an international discourse to protect the ethos of each society, but particularly the values of freedom, liberty, and free speech that must exist within them. It allows us and alerts us to the potential for appropriate adjudication and utilization of the wisdom of other courts and the experience of constitution framers and interpreters and scholars across the globe. It is valuable not only because it gives us an insight into the thinking of others, but because it allows us a far greater insight into our own, own decisions. It is the process of analysis of other courts in other jurisdictions that gives us that degree of detachment that allows us to look at our own with what is necessary, a degree of detachment also. Why I'm a little skeptical regarding the sampling process can I think be looked at now when we look at some of the excerpts from the second book I referred to. These are graphs. I'm looking at all of you to see how many of you are numerate and how many of you these, to whom these graphs convey a great deal. In fact, in fairness, if you look carefully in the, at the Cambridge University Press book, you do see explanations for the phenomena which are outlined in each of the graphs. But if we look at the next one, we, we actually see something quite significant which is the way in which certain values became more prevalent over the period of examination. That's worth thinking about, and it's worth wondering why that was. And then if we look at one more, we see something perhaps a little bit less convincing. And I'm saying this as an Irish person, talking about the Cambridge, the Cambridge book, because if you look at the far, I'll just go over here. There. There's supposed to be a cluster of common law store, uh, courts and jurisdictions which are on the far right. Now, we are, if we're anything, we are a common law country. And yet we find ourselves over towards the the other side in a different group, uh, along with Formosa, Taiwan. I'm not sure why that happened, and it raises questions in my mind regarding methodology. It seems to me that when you look at statistics, you must be extremely careful to ask what is the sample, what are the criteria, are the criteria meaningful, and in many ways I think that one, one must look at these as a lawyer engaging in the, law, in the lawyer's discipline. So I think it's hard to lay down hard and fast rules and numbers, but I think the discipline may evolve further. But what to my mind is, has been so valuable about this is that we've engaged in a new and exciting discipline, but to my mind some of the scholarship is either over-reductionist or over-broad in its terminology. We must look very carefully at criteria and terminology when we're seeking to put numbers, because input in, in statistics is the area where there can be a weakness. There is also, I want to say from my own experience, the risk of 
a priorism in the usage of statistics. And I think I gave an example during the week where we had a constitutional, a challenge to a constitutional referendum. Political scientists gave evidence saying that the uh, effect of the government campaign in Ireland could and would have materially affected the outcome of the referendum. They used a model which actually brought the no figure beyond the yes figure. But what they didn't notice was that the figures themselves were unreliable because the people who had been polled as to their voting had not told the truth all the time. That hadn't been noticed. So I am happy to buy into the idea of bricolage, that is, the usage of what comes to hand, which is Mark Tushnet's idea. For myself, um, I, I think that it can be used as both, as I said at the very first lecture, as a prism and a mirror. And I think that when you apply the, the, pre, the precepts, you can actually learn a very great deal as to how we expound constitutional values in the courts. I hope also I've given an idea of how judges think because what you're seeing here uh, with all the deficiencies is a judge who engages in constitutional importance in interpretation. So far as I'm concerned, uh, one can look to, at Goldsworthy's book, Interpreting Constitutions in 2008, which has no graphs and no dendrograms, and he looks at issues such as legal culture, political culture, homogeneity in judicial appointments, the nature and age of the Constitution, the felt necessities of the time. And it seems to me that those rather literal criteria are as close to the mark as any. I said thank you before to all of you and I now want to repeat it in the most heartfelt way I can. I want to say thank you to your wonderful university in Alsa. And I also, um, I can literally say, that there's a fra phrase we use in Ireland, been there, got the t-shirt. And I can literally say, I have been here, I have got the t-shirt, and I'm bringing them home, and I'm proud. I'd be proud to wear it, and I'd be proud to wear it to the, at the expense and the irritation of my colleagues. I want to thank Vasanti for her absolute magnificent assistance. Uh, without her, none of this would have happened. But I also want to thank Malavika, without, without, without whom none of this would have happened. She has made this possible and it's no exaggeration to say without it, without her, it would all have been impossible. And um, we therefore, I have been the, the willing slave of Vesanti, the slave driver, as I've called her at many of the, the dinners. And um, we've had Malvika to do the worrying and we've had Vesanti to do the calming down and me to sit there between the two of them just hoping it'll all work out and miraculously it has. And thank you so much to them and thank you so much to you and I hope now you'll join me for a drink outside and there are no more questions. Thank you very much. So we have a while before we go out and snack. And we thought it would be a nice idea to open the floor to any students who would like to come up and say anything about either the course or their experiences speaking with Judge McMenamin or even just the hilarious fun dinners that we had. So anybody who would like to say something, feel free, the floor is yours. And we have about 25 minutes. Um, 
Okay. On behalf of the NALSA student community, I would like to thank Judge McManaman for giving us what I believe has been one of the most enlightening weeks we've had here. I believe I speak for many here when I say that this course has brought to light the value and importance of comparative constitutionalism and taught us which questions we have to ask and which processes to apply. It has inspired us to question a lot of things, principles, and assumptions we take for granted, pushing us to make more critical inquiries, especially in the field of comparative constitutional law. In comparative constitutions and understanding why and how, uh, why and which jurisprudence we use, we have unpacked what, constitution, what constitutions are and which questions are important to the process of borrowing and more than that, adopting the jurisprudence that we use. This has happened not only in the formal setting of the classroom, but also in the informal settings at the dinners that we've had, where we've shared anecdotes and experiences and gotten a little insight as to how, as to how a judge's mind works and how we can engage with that question. This has been really enlightening for all of us. We hope to see you here again, and we thank you for taking time and taking this course for all of us. Thank you very much. You're still a troublemaker. Thank you all very much indeed. Oh. Hi. Oh. Um, yeah, so Vasanti Hong couldn't be here. She was, she was busy in a meeting. But uh, I would like to thank you for taking this course for us. I think for me, uh, not just the understanding of the concepts in Indian and Irish courts, but I think your personal experience, you know, the way you gave examples of your own personal experience with each and every uh, thing that we learned, that was, uh, I think that that's what made me learn a lot more than uh, a book or like a theory would have. So thank you for sharing your experiences with us. And uh, yeah, I would also like to encourage all of you to uh, chip in and if you want to appreciate uh, Judge here, you're most welcome to. Thank you. Well, I'm getting all embarrassed now. I, I think we should stop. And, uh, <laughs> let's go and have a drink. Uh, listen, it's been one of the great experiences of my life. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, the brownies will take another 10, 15 minutes, so, and there's more. So <laughs> can we just give this another 15 minutes? Is the camera off or on? Because the last time it was on when someone told me it was off. Amritam will save the day. Yeah. Um, so, can we have Harsha for some days' best contribution? I can't remember which one at this point. <laughs> <laughs>